get into it. Uh, what's up? What's up? Welcome to another episode of All Over VoiceOver with Kiff VH. I'm your host, Kiff VH. Welcome. And uh, I'm so excited to um, to to bring in a, a really fascinating uh, uh, a guy I've gotten to know fairly well, I would say, over the past, uh, over pandemic. Uh, we, we've yeah. known each other through social media and whatnot. We have a ton of similar friends. And then we started doing QuadraFit together and became... Uh, Good morning, running, uh, punching the ground, uh, kicking ass, uh, buddies, and uh, found out we have a lot more in common than we thought. And uh, I'm so excited to to get a chance to talk to you. Alan Maxson is here. Alan, um, dude, I, I mean, it's uh, well. First of all, like you do, you do such a wide variety of things, and it's one of the things that made me excited about about talking with you. Like, um, thank you. You know, you're in. You're a creature performer. You're in motion capture. You, um, uh, you, you're an independent filmmaker. You've, you've, you, you're in the middle of producing uh, and directing a, a, a feature that you wrote called Alien Planet. Um, and I want to, I want to talk more about all those things. I just want to start off by like dive deep. Like where I know you're from Michigan. We're both from Michigan. So w- tell, tell me about growing up. Where are you, where are you from and all that stuff? Wow. We're going, we're going real. Yeah. Deep. Yeah. 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 I want to backtrack to something you said at the beginning first. Yeah. You said we have gotten to know each other very well with punching the ground, hard hitting workouts. <laughs> I'd like to say, I think the way we got to be so close yeah. could not have happened if we didn't go through that for the simple fact that basically four days a week for the last six months, we torture ourselves with pain. (laughs) And I don't know any better way to bond with somebody other than like you're almost in tears and you just stand next to the person and go, let's keep going. Yeah. That's like bonding right there. It is forever tied. Dude, you standing there at the bottom of that sand hill with me and you guys had done 10 and I'd done eight. Uh, This is a shorthand, but this is going up and down probably what a a three hundred foot sand dune uh, on Huge. it's on on all fours using arm extensions with Terry Notary was a guest on the show before so if you listen to the show consistently you've heard Terry's story and we've been working out with Terry going up and down and I'm looking at Alan going I don't know I don't have it and you're like come on one more you got this and I was like you're right one more I got this and I did I did have yeah. it. and it was like yes, you did. constantly meeting that wall of what you think you can do and then having someone else be able to say not, not like, um, just do it. Come on, suck it up. But no, I believe in you. I believe in you. And I know what you're made of because I see it every morning. Come on. And it's also genuine too. It's it's not like we tell, we all tend to think of gym buddies. Come on, bro, bro. Or gym teachers in high school forcing you to do it. But I feel like what we all have with QuadraFit is, we are genuine and we're not lying to each other. Like yeah. when I looked at you and said that, it wasn't because I wanted to push you to see if you could. It was right. because I saw you and I was like, no, you you actually do. I know you do. I see it. Right. And that's what allows us to keep pushing and getting stronger. That's right. And it's interesting that mentality and genuine belief in each other, yeah. I think is rare. And we just have such a great group Yes, that that's what that. That's what allows us to grow so well. Is there anything more powerful than having people believe in you? No, not at all. You know, especially if it's not like your parents, like they're they're In some respects, it's like it's your colleagues and, and even in some respects, your competitors, like you're up against Hunter for mocap stuff. You know what I mean? Like yes. we're all in this mix together, but it's that that thing that bonds us together and um yeah dude i love you and i i i love what we've been able to accomplish and the way we've changed our bodies and our minds over the past absolutely you know feelings are mutual awesome man Uh, yeah Yeah, it's great so so, anyways that was a weird sidetrack back to your intro (laughs) no i appreciate that i i I really do that's awesome what tell me tell me about growing up you're you're from you're from uh east michigan right the thumb area yes. from Bay City. Bay City. Yep, I grew up in Bay City, Michigan. Um, you know, I, I guess most of the people probably on your your show have similar childhoods. Is I started out uh, doing drama class and the musical, the musicals in the school, and I was in varsity choir for four years. So it was just performing, and and uh, and I was in 
I was in bands. I used to scratch on the turntables. <laughs> Did you and, really? Uh, oh my yeah. gosh. No yeah. kidding. Cause you know, it was incubus limp biscuit. It was all popular. And, yeah. and to this day, that's some of my favorite. Like I love a good turntable solo during a rock band. Like <laughs> I absolutely love it. And, uh, that's why I think Rage Against the Machines, I always say Tom Morello is my favorite guitarist oh, man. because his guitar sounds like turntables. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. That's so true. Oh, my God. I love Tom Morello. Too. I love his stuff with Audio Slave. He was, he was something else. Yes, yes. Yeah. They're just so talented. But, yeah. like, you know, that was my early, you know, from eighth grade and on, it was performing, writing, creating. Mm. And, and that was, it wasn't even like, I didn't, I didn't go into it thinking like, this is, this is who I'll be. It was just, I just dove in because it was like, it was great. I was good. I loved it. Yeah. And it made me happy. Yeah. And I continued all the way through college. I went to community college for two years in mm -hmm. Michigan. Where um, did you go? Uh, Delta college. Okay. It's in, I, th I think technically it's in Saginaw. I okay. Think. Okay. But, um, it, I went for broadcasting. So I got my associates in broadcasting. Yeah. I mean that was and, that's the extent of communications that you get yes. in Michigan really is is broadcasting because that's what's there. Yeah. You can't do any more of that. You know, I, I yeah. meet a lot of people out here who they talk about how they had editing in high school and I'm like, What fancy <laughs> high school did you go to? We didn't right. even have dang computers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but and then after that I was like I was like, broadcasting isn't technically what I want to do. I want to do movies and film. Yeah. So I ended up going to Full Sail in Florida. Oh, wow. And I got my, my bachelor's in filmmaking. And all throughout all of that, I, I continued to practice, you know, performance stuff. You know, whenever yeah. I was, you know, the broadcasting, most of it is also on camera. It's a lot of teleprompter work and news oh, work. Wow. Um, while learning the tech side, because that's part of, if you know anything about current day news, it's no longer a team, a camera guy, audio host. It's it's a lot of one person. Yeah. They give you a tripod, a camera, and your lavalier, and you go out there, you film your on-the-spot news segment yourself, take it back and edit it, give it to the, the people that air it for the next segment. You know, yeah. it's you do it all, and that's kind of how we were taught. Yeah. And I think that plays heavily into how I work now with the doing it all kind of stuff. Yeah. And, yeah. and same with when I went to film school, it, it was a lot of while I was working on film as crew and learning editing, directing camera, when my friends were doing that, I was their talent and vice versa. <laughs> right. So the, the continual growth of, of the filmmaking process, the tech side and the on camera side, yeah. it just all continued to grow. Yeah. And, and when I graduated, I, it was funny cause it was, it was, it was, you know, the recession time. Okay. And so I was like a lot of people, I had a bachelor's degree, two associates and I was working at the mall making, making minimum wage. And I was like, God damn it. <laughs> so I, I spent some time doing that, saving as much as I could till I had enough to move to Los Angeles. Yeah. And then in 07, I moved to Los Angeles and I just hustled my way doing everything I could, um, working in post-production mainly. That was your and inroad. I mean, you had experience work. I mean, it's one of the great things about sort of, I mean, my, my background is similar of like this patchwork career based on what's around yeah. you regionally where you are. And yeah. and you end up becoming, you know, I, I resent the phrase jack of all trades, master of none, because no, I'm a master editor. I'm a master shooter. I'm a master audio record engineer. All those things. Yeah. You know, granted, I don't have 40 years behind me of doing those, each of those things, but, but you do them all well. Yeah, exactly. I, and I like to joke, I like to say, I'm a jack of all trades, master of three. <laughs> 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 because I would never in a million or in a million years call myself a master of camera and lighting. Yeah. But yeah. I will tell you, I am a master of editing. I have worked on. I guarantee you, if you've watched television, you've seen my work. Yeah. Um, I do consider myself a very talented director. I'm good at it. Yeah. Um, 
acting, I would consider myself a very talented, successful actor. I've yeah. been in huge budget movies and shows and yeah. award winning things. So, yeah. you know, I would say I'm a master of three. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I, I take that. I, I think that's a, that's a really great, it's a great way of phrasing it too. And it's, uh, because yeah. it's funny and it's true and there's nothing yeah. better than funny and true. <laughs> exactly. But then there's certain things too, where it's like, like you could be, you know, you, you say, say audio, like I'm yeah. fairly, fairly decent at sound design and Foley. Yeah. I actually do all the sound design and Foley for all of my past films. That's great. And if you specifically watch my last short film called patina yeah it's a robot you hear a lot of awesome squeaking gear sound work in the movement <laughs> yeah. and especially if you use good headphones and really listen there's layers in there and i i did a i i'm proud of what i did That's so um, great, i wouldn't call me a master sound design fully person just because you know i haven't been hired to do it for giant projects right but i do it so well that I'm confident to not hire someone for mine. That's right. That's great. If it if it passes muster on my own project, I'm I'm happy. And yeah, yes. And I, I man, I'll tell you another day about the day I met the a master foley artist on the set of at um 20th Century Fox. Well, I'll tell you now. Uh, tell me. Tell I was me. I was doing ADR for Call of the Wild, matching Harrison Ford, and we get done with the session and. I made friends with a post-production supervisor. Great guy. We had lunch together that day. And he was like, uh, do you know what Foley is? I was like, oh, of course I know what Foley is. He was like, I, I, <laughs> what do I look like? What do I look like? I mean, I've been I've been sitting here spouting off stuff about Stanley Kubrick and talking about different filmmakers. <laughs> he was like, well, if you can hang out for like five minutes after the session's over, do you have time? I was like, yeah. He was like, I'll, I'll, let me, I have a surprise for you. So we get done, we wrap in the in the Marge Simpson stage where we were doing the ADR, and then uh, I'm hanging out, and then John comes and grabs me and takes me down to the Foley stage downstairs. And inside is this wiry, this wonderful, madcap dude, like in a black t-shirt and black sweats, and he looked like he looked like Curtis Hansen, you know, the filmmaker. He looked like a like a seventy year old Jim Henson with short curly hair. He was like, "Hey, how are you, man? Welcome." And I was like, "Hi." He's like, "I'm John. What's your name?" I'm Kiv. It's great to meet you. I almost the way you impersonate him, I'm imagining uh, Brent Spiner from Independence Day. <laughs> uh, not not far off. And he's like, uh, do, "Do you know anything about Foley?" And I was like, oh, yeah. He was like, well, I'd love to show you. I'm working on a movie right now. Turns out the movie he was working on was John Wick 3. <laughs> and Dude, talk about Foley. Right? I mean, just incredible, the amount of cues. And the way these guys do Foley cues is the way you do mocap cues. You know, it's just like, get it, do it, is it good, move on. Checklist. Like, checklist. Boom, 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 exactly, boom, boom. exactly. And he was like, watch this. And he put on this pair of shoes and then put me in the booth, and then shows a clip of Cameron Diaz from some movie, and he's walking, and and uh, John comes into the room with me, and he's like, watch him, watch him, don't watch the screen, watch him. So I'm watching him like do these little moves and how he stepped and different textures of things he's stepping on, and he does like five cues in a row. So like walking, but then a jingle, and then a shift, and it sounds like he's wearing heels. And he shows me the shoes. He's like, these are like these flat, like sort of like Rockport shoes with little metal tips on the bottom. He said, I bought these to do Bruce Willis's efforts in Hudson Hawk. And they sound like women's high heels now. So That's amazing. Isn't it cool? So he would like walk on carpet and then walk on linoleum. And what was fascinating about it was the story it was telling about the environment that the camera would never see. Yep. And, uh, and he did that for like two or three pieces. And it was just like... Just the kind of thing that you wish was on a studio tour, but then you're also like, I'm glad this is this is private. This is just for me. Yeah. I, I can't believe the education yep. I'm getting, you know? The, th Amazing. the thing that bums me out about streaming and the lack of people buying Blu-rays mm. is growing up, my favorite behind the scenes to watch were Ben Burt. Oh when yes. You watch him do like Jurassic Park yeah. and Star Wars. It's just like it's amazing to watch these people work. And I think I saw a great one on Lord of the Rings at one point that you're just like, wow. Oh man. The supplementals are the greatest part of it. It's just like food. Like Robert Rodriguez's uh 10 minute film school that he has on every one of his DVDs. And like, 
all the stuff on the I, I've been I, I, we've I've been doubling down on physical media as of late for that very reason, you know, just yep. to just to continue to feed myself with like the science behind. So there's a whole documentary yep. about the science of Interstellar on the Interstellar Blu-ray. It was like oh nice fascinating. Anyway, I uh, love it. <laughs> you can see we, we'll, we'll easily turn it. <laughs> well worth a rabbit trail. Well worth a rabbit trail, without a doubt. <laughs> So you you moved to Los Angeles, um, and and how how is it that you found yourself in in post production? What was what was what the like of the things that got you in? Was it an an in? Was it an ad? Was it uh, you know a real? Like how did you how did you crack that nut? Well, as most people who look into moving to Los Angeles find out, <clears throat> nobody will hire you unless you already live here. Yes. So I moved up here and I was like, you know what? Shot in the dark. Let's just do it. And I stayed with my aunt and uncle in Arizona on the drive for one night. Yeah. And my uncle, he was like, oh, yeah, some guy I went to high school with. He owns a, a shop out there. I'll recommend you to him. And he did. And I went and met him. And he owned this little hole in the wall mom and pop shop where you they edit uh, – actor demo reels <laughs> awesome and i thought i passed the test he later told me he only hired me because i was friends with his buddy or i was <laughs> a nephew of his buddy um he's like if you weren't i would never have hired you so <laughs> but since then so he hired me so I, I spent you know a year there editing actor demo reels wow and i've edited for some very fantastic people and i got to know a lot of people in the industry doing it wow. and then i eventually moved on and got a job doing freelance and it, it just kept snowballing and trickling moved my way up from a post pa to an ae assistant editor uh -huh. to an editor and now i'm i'm a lead editor on most shows that i work on Amazing. and uh and and i just went down that path because it it paid the bills. And as yeah. we know, you being an actor yeah. uh, doesn't always. And if it does, it's sporadic. One That's month, right. it won't. That's right. So, and especially during, you know, the pandemic, I, I always joke, Ice T saved my 2020 because I edit his crime show on Oxygen. That's so great. So great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, man. So, so, uh, you, 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 you get a foothold in and it leads you into what now for some people that would be enough. I'm living the dream. I'm working as an editor in Hollywood and I'm the lead editor and I'm working on ice tea show. What is it about? <laughs> what is it about what a goal? Yeah. I mean, it is, but it is like, that's the funny thing. Like you, you come out here cause I, 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 that so resonates with me of like, trying once you get out here going i just need to be in that marketplace i just need to be there i don't know what i want to do i could say oh i want to win an academy award for best screenplay or whatever but like but in reality it's like i want to be out here in the mix with these people seeing how high i can jump and i want to be alongside them and i want to be part of the thing that i love and that's enough um so like what you know you're alongside that and most people probably don't know you from your editing they know you from like from you know certainly one of the more high profile things that you've done with Godzilla King of the Monsters is King Ghidorah like you know and 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 the shorts that you've made and those things like what's what's that aspect of your personality that drives you to explore that is that where you want to be do you want to be um, and, and, and how did you get there for, for people who are listening, like who are really interested in motion capture or even beyond that, this is a, this is turning into a, an essay question. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll parse it back out. Uh, what, what is that about that, that you want to be doing that's driving you? Well, when, when I was getting knee deep into post-production mm. and I was moving up, um, I would, I took probably a good, I don't know, three, four, maybe, maybe even five years of, I don't think I performed at all. I was just focusing on getting my feet on the ground Yes. because as anyone knows, it's expensive and it's hard to yeah. live in Los Angeles. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people come here and have it a lot easier to have help from 
parents or just they come from money or something, but um, I had no help. So it, to me, it was, I just had to get my feet on the ground and be secure so that I can genuinely just eat and afford rent. Yes. And once I got to that spot where I was in that groove and I was secure, I was starting to crave something more because editing is not my passion. Editing is not, um, it, it's not truly what I want as an end goal. Yeah. And, and it was, it was bringing me down and I was, I was like, I just don't, I just, I'm not happy. It's not what my heart is. Like I remember being in, in high school and college and when I was performing and acting, being passionate and, and excited. Yeah. And now it's just, it's, it's another paycheck. Yeah. And so I wanted to get back into creative juices that excite me. And after doing lots of, of hard thinking and, and, and focusing on an actual goal and a path to be on, because I didn't want to just willy nilly go on a few paths. I wanted yeah. to set my sights and focus. Yeah. Um, I, I was like back to the heart of where, where I came from performing mm. and my thought after deciding that was, but I, I don't want to just be a performer because knowing my type, my body, my look, my voice, the type of characters I would be cast in weren't doing, weren't giving me that desire craving yeah. that I wanted. I totally understand what you mean. Yeah. And so I thought I've always loved out of every movie, the creature, the monster, when I would buy action figures, I never bought the human. And so <laughs> it just seemed right. I was like, this is it. I want to be a creature performer. I want to yeah. bring to life non-human characters. Yeah. And I set that as a goal and I started networking with every person I can. I, I went out and did as many films as I could. I started doing student films. I found student films that needed monsters huh. just to build a reel. Yeah. And then I had the small reel of student film monsters and I took it to an agent and he was like, listen, this isn't a lot and it's not anything credible, but I see your drive and I don't think you're going to stop. So I'm signing you. Wow. And, and I signed with him and I kept going and I started taking many more classes uh, with movement, stunt, performance, acting, acting technique, scene study, everything regular actors do because there is no difference between creature acting and human acting. That's right. There is yes. no difference. Yes. And so I took all the acting courses I could, um, got physical, just kept pushing in every direction. Um, I even, I attempted to study mime for a couple of years. Yeah. I could technically say I, I studied mime for two or three years on a regular basis, but I couldn't do a thing that would impress you for the life of me. <laughs> um, but it's movement. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, I took away so much from those studies that I use in every monster. Really? But you wouldn't know it because it's not trapped in a box or pulling a string. Yeah, yeah. You know? It's like the subtle internal stuff, right? That kind of... Uh, it's almost like what Terry talks about with us is he calls it strength in the core. Hmm. In mime, it's called suspension. Hmm. Nothing is loose. Don't let your ass hang. Don't let your fingers hang. Everything has life. You Make sure not, not a single inch of you is boring. And that's why a lot of times when you see like Doug Jones, he's got the fingers. Yeah. That's suspension. And Doug Jones is a mime. He's a true mime. He actually studied with Marceau Marceau. Did he really? I didn't know that. So he oh, did. Man. And actually my, my mime teacher studied with Marceau Marceau as well. Wow. That's fascinating. Yep. Oh man. Um, and so that's the path I took. And I was just, I was so passionate. And I, I did all these films. I worked almost every actor job for free for maybe the first three years, maybe four years of pursuing it wow. professionally, just because I was like, it doesn't matter. 
if I'm being paid, this is the goal I want. Yeah. And now, obviously, I, I don't act for free now. I just don't yeah. have the time. Of course. And, and I'm, I just don't, I have, I'm, I've, I've outgrown that. Yeah. And that's part of, <laughs> that's part of your development process. And, and especially if it's like, you don't have the school for it. The school is what you have to create for yourself. And yes. if I, the, the real pay is the opportunity to do and, and to get a little bit of tape and like, <laughs> You know, you get you do get to a place in your career where you look at a at a breakdown and go, I ain't doing that. Uh, but but you also realize you go, that's someone else's work. There's some kid five years behind me who is needing that experience. Yes. yes. They need to be on that set, not me. You know? And you start to learn too, you start to learn people fight for you. So mm. example, I was on a shoot two or three days ago, and I have another film coming up that that I'm going to play a creature in and they were recommending and fighting for me to be in that movie. And so it goes from so awesome. knocking on doors and begging to be on screen to suddenly you get calls and like, we've had a million meetings about you and you didn't even know it. Will you be in our film? <laughs> oh, that's so amazing. It's so amazing. It's everything you hope for. And it's those yes. little moments that just make you go, not like, oh, I've made it, but that it it warms your heart because you, you see the the generosity of yes. the creative people here, you know? And, and and I reached my goal because I'm proud of my work now. Yeah. Editing, yes. I'm proud that I went through the trenches and and made my way and, and got it awesome, but but I don't get the same feeling watching the shows I've edited as I do. Like when you, if you watch my demo reel, maybe you can like put it in the link or something. Sure. Um, it's three minutes of the last decade of my monster career. And every time I watch it, I'm just so proud. And, and it's, I recently updated so it with new good. footage from last year and I posted it and just watching everybody comment like, wow, amazing. Yeah. I'm like, that's what I do this for is yeah. because that's how I feel when I watch other monsters on screen yeah. and I just love it. You know, creatures, monsters they are so awesome. And I'm not just saying this because I do it, but literally every other creature actor does not get enough props for what they do. Oh, man. Monster and creature performance is the most underrated physical performer on screen history. Can you can you talk can you expand on that idea a little bit more? I'd love to hear just from an inside's perspective of because I, I there there are certain you know silent slash creature performances that still blow me away. Like Karloff still blows me away as the Frankenstein monster. The yes. you know some of the OG characters and then the the subtle stuff that you see both Doug Jones do in. From yes. I mean his his stuff in Hellboy and I mean like in Pan's Labyrinth with the 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 creature with the eyes like the, just this innovative movement signature. Yes. Um, it, it, talk from the inside of that. Talk talk to me a little bit about um, about what that why that not necessarily why you think it's underrated but but you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I think it's because the viewer doesn't realize what goes into it hmm. so take i guess take for example let's, let's talk about harry and the hendersons yes a movie that the average viewer would watch and they would laugh and they'd enjoy it and be like great that was a cute funny movie from the 90s or whatever it was and great moving on never think twice about it if they did their second thought would be, yeah, John Lithgow, that's like when he was young, but he still looked old, you know? Right. No one thinks about, um, I believe it was Kevin, Peter Kevin Hall, Hall yeah, I Kevin believe, Hall. was in that suit. Yeah. And imagine being in that suit. One, it's huge. It's heavy. Yeah. It's claustrophobic and it's hot. There's that a, alone. The face rig too, right? Like there's a, there's a the remote animatronic, animatronic face yeah. head rig. That alone is a feat just to be in and not scream. But on top of it, the thing that people don't think about is think about the performance. In that movie, you cry. There's multiple moments where you're sad. Oh yeah. And it's because you believe Harry. Yeah. And you mentioned the animatronics in his face. You don't see Kevin Hall's face. 
you see animatronics. Yeah. So what makes you believe it? Oh, it's his his movement, his yeah. posture, his subtleties in his shoulder, his head nods and turns, the way he carries his body during each particular emotional moment. It is so powerful that he makes you cry and you don't see his face and he doesn't have a single line. Yet, right. people, most people don't know who's even under there. I mean, yeah. it's shameful to me. I even had to say, I think it was Kevin Hall under there. You know, the <laughs> fact that I had to double think myself for a moment, <laughs> that right there is shameful and terrible because it's a fantastic performance. It's and I think performance. that's what's underrated about creature performers is I think the average audience unintentionally yeah. doesn't understand the amount of respect that actually should be given. And in a way, like, you know, you want the respect, but you also want the audience to go, that's just Bigfoot. That's yes. just the predator. That's just, that's just an alien in, and not yes. thinking about the guy and like trying to find a way to disappear as a, as a human character. I mean, the work that we've been doing with the, with the ape arm extensions to, to try to make our human movement signature vanish so that yes. it's so complete that the audience is transported by these apes that yep. ride horses and carry guns. And they believe it when we're on the trails, people yeah. are truly, they come to us and like, whoa, we were generally taken back for a moment because you guys really looked like apes. Yeah. And how animals so freak out. Were. That, that yes. the, when the, the when the dogs, dogs when the dogs and horse there was a horse one time we were doing a workshop and a horse freaked out and a woman cussed us out we were like well sorry we're it's a public park. I must have not been there for that it was one of those like one off Terry workshops you know where we're up in Calabasas for a day yeah 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 but and um, you know a lot of the I think I don't want to put full blame on anybody because there's a million reasons that lead up to this silent hero thing but I think one of the biggest issues is filmmakers and studios don't give the credit like in harry mm -hmm. henderson's uh kevin peter hall is credited but it should be like bigger and more it should say kevin peter hall as yeah harry. yes and same with even you know godzilla i mean we were i'm so grateful we were credited um it said king Ghidorah performance capture which is awesome yeah but before that credit under the cast, it says King Ghidorah as himself. Yes. And a lot of people see that the average audience stops reading after that. Mm. And yes, it's a funny joke and you go, ha ha, he played himself. But the average Joe doesn't keep reading that. Oh, performance capture. Whoa, someone actually brought those movements to the computer before the animators right. dove deep into it. Right. That's right. So there's That's a right. lot of little things that, that I think just add up to it being an unsung hero type of a moment for almost every yeah. creature performer. Absolutely true. Oh man. Talk, talk to me about that process, about that. Like, you know, you clearly, you put in the work and the time and, and all of that to get in a place where that opportunity came to you. And, you know, you told me before we started how, how long you actually worked on that picture, how quickly, well, how quickly you can c complete a, a, a shot list of motion capture requirements. And you guys, you had the unique experience, too, of like working, working with two other guys to build this character. Um, you yeah. know, what, what was that? What was that experience like? Honestly, Godzilla was one of the greatest experiences. It's mm -hmm. one of my favorite jobs. Um, we just had so much fun. It was, we worked for a total of three days. And if you've seen this movie, <laughs> it's amazing. the whole, the movie, we're in a ton of it. And we did all of that performance capture in three days, but it makes sense because it was so well organized. Mm -hmm. That's all we needed. Wow. And what we did was we had, we had one day we came in before those three where Jason, Richard, and I sat down and we just watched. We saw the entire movie a year before it was released to the public. And it had very rough pre viz CG uh, kaiju in it so we yeah. could get an idea of what we're going to be doing. Gotcha. Was there, was, action, over, was there action in the animatics or was it just kind of like he's attacking a building or he's blowing fire or he's like... There was action. Okay. There was action in it for sure. Some of it was more rough than others. Some of yeah. it was more smooth but you know it was just they were clearly uh still working in post and they had a whole year ahead of them still yeah um 
but the movie was fantastic and we we're like great now we have an idea and we're excited the next day we came in and, and started our three-day process and what they did was uh, mike daughtery he just he had a big monitor in the volume he would play a clip of that moment whether it's part of the fight a stunt a like a walk a crawl whatever this the moment was we'd watch it the three of us would get together kind of walk through it do a step through and then we'd rehearse it we'd do two three worst case scenario four takes and then they great next shot we'd watch it study it walk through do it again wow. and it was so well organized because they had that pre yeah and because it was very specific like when you pay attention to the godzilla movie the story of the kaiju is very specific hmm. they all have goals king Ghidorah is attempting to be the the king of the others he's taking over when he doesn't get his way he thrashes out into buildings uh -huh. and he tries to get these other like at one point rodan is on his side yeah and and so it's very like there's intention and thought and a story arc so it's not just random battles we grab we roll around and smack each other it was <laughs> there's very specific plot points yeah. to our movement oh, and awful. and so it that's made great. it so easy to just check off each list and go down and by the end of it the last scene we did was uh, uh, we all played different kaiju and we were bowing down to Godzilla at the end moment. And we, we all got in our little positions and did a bow. And and so we went through the whole movie, chronological order, and, and did the movement out in, in that way. Amazing. Oh, it's fascinating. So Yeah, it was so fun. As, as, a, as a filmmaker, how does that experience of you know, getting to work with, with Mike on this film and work with these collaborators and especially like the pre and your knowledge of post-production as it stands already, how does that inform your ability to go into, not necessarily inform your ability, but inform your process as you go about the business of, of uh, making you, you know, your short film like Patina, working on, on your new film, Alien Planet? Like what's, what's that experience? How is that informed by your experience? Genuinely, all three, my my acting, my editing, and my filmmaking have all just blended and, and helped each other immensely. Hmm. So even when it comes to something like performing, knowing editing and filmmaking and having been on the other side of the camera has, I think, made me a better creature actor by far, just for the simple fact that most monsters are filmed specifically in a way for camera or filmed for how they're going to edit it filmed in a way to have a camera trick or a special effect hmm. or visual effect. There's, there's a lot of technicalities involved and it's not just, um, not just acting it's acting, but being aware of the technical side, whether it's practical or CG yeah. um, it's being aware of that because all of these things always have camera tricks and setups or yeah. I'm working with the effects artist who shoots the blood can at the right moment and stuff like that to, yeah. to coincide with it and, and it hit the right angle or forced perspective, things like that, that they do for the characters I play. Yeah. And so filmmaking has helped me for sure be a better creature actor and then vice versa acting allows me to be a way better editor and director hmm. because I know how an actor is thinking when I am talking to them for a scene. Yes. I know how to direct or explain or give a reference of what I'm looking for, for a slightly different performance yeah. because I've been in their shoes many times. Yeah, And then editing is the same because I know how, emotion comes out of a person yes i know how it's portrayed on screen and how it should flow in a way that if you don't know that some editors can do you know let's use an example of drastic terms would be you watch a youtube a youtuber their edits are chop 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 yep. and if there's any emotion in it it's gone right. whereas if you if you know how a a subtlety in someone's face, just the slight change of 
of eye movement marks the moment in their thought process of of their character arc changing to the next emotion you don't want to get rid of that so when you're editing you want to make sure you're cutting at the right moment and to the right angle or size to portray that that emotion correctly and it's such subtleties that that you might not realize and i feel like mm. generally just those three my three strengths specifically in the last couple of years have really blended together in a way that i'm almost having a hard time telling them apart i use all three of them every time and so it, it's definitely been a growing inside me process of those three things merging and and it feels like it's one big pot of of filmmaking mush yeah oh that's beautiful it's so true it can't not affect it can't not inform and 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 it does make you more you know along with the practicality of it along with being able to schedule appropriately and to be able to feel your way through how much time how much budget i need all those other things it makes you so much more intuitive uh, on all those fronts as you work with your collaborators to to build that to to tell that story uh, it's yes. just it's it's beautiful and when you can explain it on set when you're working with you know with great actors do do you um tell tell me a bit about about the process of of alien planet how this film is has kind of come about and 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 you know what your goal is and all that kind of stuff absolutely so um i guess from just the beginning of it uh, tell me if I already said this. I don't remember. I've said it a million times over the last <laughs> few days for this I know, campaign. I, know. Um, I started writing it maybe two years ago. Really? Um, I started conceptualizing it for a very, very long time. I've always wanted to make a sci-fi movie in the vein of Enemy Mine with <laughs> Louis Gossett Jr. Yeah. and Dennis Quaid. Yeah. And I have to give a shout out. When anyone mentions that movie, everyone goes, oh, the Dennis Quaid movie. But I have to say, Louis Gossett Jr. is the heart yeah. of that movie. He makes that movie. And it's another unsung hero. Yeah. He, yes, gets second billing in that movie. But he is going through so much torture of those prosthetics. And his performance as an actor is just phenomenal without makeup. But even with yeah. the makeup... He plays through it. He projects through those prosthetics yeah. so beautifully. That movie is one of the most heartwarming, touching films in sci-fi. Yeah. Okay. And so for many, many years, I've wanted to make a movie in the vein of that. Yes. And I started conceptualizing it a couple of years ago after I made my first film, which is a very terrible B movie uh, <laughs> called Christmas with Cookie. And I made this movie for $1,000. Oh my God. For the simple fact that that's all I had. And I was like, let's make a movie for that. Yeah. And yeah. Be because you can't really make a movie for $1,000, I, I leaned into it. I, I wrote the script to be aware that it's a bad movie and so it actually ended up getting a, a pretty decent cult following there's a That's lot great. of big cookie lovers out there <laughs> and uh they they enjoy that terrible terrible movie that i can even barely sit through um but because my next thought was this alien planet it was not named that at the time but um i thought to myself nobody's gonna help fund me if Christmas with cookie is my only thing to show for. Yes. So I took a break and I wrote a short film yeah. within my budget. I put a little bit more money into it and it's 10 minutes long. So the money went farther. Yeah. And it, it had much more substance and a serious tone. The end ends up having a less serious tone because it's a little yeah. bit of a joke at the end. Yeah. But the whole time, the tension and, and the, the movie takes it, itself serious whereas cookie did not yeah. so i made that as kind of a proof of you know delivery i can deliver a product yes and, and that's, once pa I that's patina that, that, that's patina right patina yeah. yep um and if anyone is crazy enough to watch both of them they're both on <laughs> amazon prime um but but then after that i i started getting back to 
what is now called Alien Planet and, and just slowly working on breaking down the story and the plot and the arc and characters and stuff. And while working, because I do so much with editing and acting and training, yeah. I don't have a lot of free time. Yeah. So it was taking a very long time, but, but then the mm-hmm. pandemic hit and, <laughs> and I sat down and I was like, I told my wife, I was like, Kaylee, I'm, I'm never going to have an opportunity like this again. Yeah. Like nobody's going anywhere for a very long time. So I made a rule. I said eight hours, Monday through Friday, I'm writing the script like it's a job. Oh man. Brilliant. And it took me, I, I think like two months uh-huh. and I finished it. Brilliant. That's Whole what it feature length. If, if you don't prioritize it and make it the thing you're doing, it will remain a hobby. Yes. Yes. You know, and, and when I was done doing it, I, I went through, I think I'm on draft maybe 12 or 13 now. Yeah. And it's funny because Christmas with Cookie never made it past the first draft. And we even made a joke to it in the opening credits. We, we jokingly called it, uh, it's a first draft production. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. So this one, you know, I took my time and I made sure I, I wrote it well. And in fact, since then, I already have lots of things that I, I want to change and adjust to make it even better. As yeah. time has gone by yeah. making the spec trailer and doing the crowdfunding, my brain has continued to yeah. be creative and think about the story. And it's going to be so, I mean, it already is, I think, a very well thought out. Every actor who's auditioned, um, even people who did not get cast, yeah. has complimented the story and the writing so much, which to me is like, amazing because i'm not a writer mm-hmm. i evidently i am now but like, i would <laughs> yeah. never have considered myself one and so yeah. hearing just the positive like genuine love for the sides that they all auditioned for yeah made me so happy because i put in so much work and so much time and it'll be even better when i revisit it after this campaign yeah but but before the campaign, I, I thought, okay, I have I have Patina as a proof of something I've delivered. Now I need a proof of concept for Alien Planet. Yeah. So I thought of it as an investment for the campaign. I said, I've I've seen and supported many Indiegogos and Kickstarters. Yeah. And I was like, I want mine to be the best video out of all of them I've ever seen. Yeah. I've never seen anyone make a full on trailer. I've seen scenes. I've seen uh, people talking over uh, concept art. Yeah. And and so I said to myself, I'm going to make an actual trailer. Yeah. And I ended up, uh, sorry, I got distracted. I just saw a text that we just hit a big goal mark on our campaign right now. Dude, amazing. <laughs> amazing. <That's> so um, <laughs> Uh, we, uh, yeah, I said I wanted to make a trailer. So I actually, I started with, I drew up all of the characters. I made breakdown uh, PDFs of each character with my hand drawings, uh-huh. reference pictures from other movies, and even pictures of things like like tree bark yeah. uh, for for texture. Yeah. Like I went really deep in what I wanted. And then I hired uh, Aiden Casserly to do concept poster art which is the poster art for the campaign of the two aliens fighting amazing and it's hilarious i'll have to show you at some point uh my drawing i drew that scene of the guy holding him and he has the gun and he's shooting him and his bones sticking out of his arm and it looks like a first grader drew it. <laughs> <laughs> but i gave that to aiden along with my pdfs of references yeah and i said this is what I want. And I also had a, a poster reference. I gave him a PDF of had to have like eight or so posters of other movies of the style and the color, the tone. Yeah. And I went real deep. I had, I had a true vision that I wanted him to help me um, bring to life. And he did so beautifully. The characters look exactly the way I want them to in that poster. Amazing. And, 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 it, and it's well, made it's fantastic i love it i i'm proud of what he did and then i took that poster and i said now let's make this the trailer and this is where my editing skills came in Mm -hmm. so for almost every show i work on i also have to edit the trailer from scratch which involves um 
working with the story producer to cr- create create and write the best VO um, yeah. that tells the story and using music, sound effects, and sound bites along with the help of the story producer um, to yeah. make make this this trailer tell the story of what you're about to see and why you should watch the show. It's like making a so, short film log line of what you're trying to do. And absolutely and every part needs to be exactly wordsmithed and perfect with the maximum yes. amount of impact. And and I think the training of editing that for many TV shows is what truly made, honestly, it was very easy to write the script for that trailer. Wow. What I did was I wrote the VO which we'll get into in a moment because it was so beautifully read by you. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, and then the sound bites, I went through my script just like I do with editing. Instead of pulling sound bites of already filmed footage, I went through the script and thought, what sound bites will perfectly fit to tell these moments within the VO that needs to tell the story? Yeah. Some of them, because the script has so much detail and and scenes reference past scenes because you know it's a 70 page script right. some of the bites i altered some of the stuff in the trailer um are altered and different in the actual script but i altered it to fit the trailer to tell the story more precisely yes. because you can't have a cluttered mess of of story in a minute 20 seconds that's right it has to be very simple and precise yeah. and i wrote this script i don't know if i sent you the script but i have a version where it's the vo and the dialogue um in the same script yeah and that's what we shot we shot it all in one day a 12-hour day we shot the entire thing amazing and i took the footage back i started cutting it together and then i reached out to my good quadrifit buddy uh kiff who i knew was the greatest uh vo master in the world (laughs) (laughs) thanks man it's so fun. It was so fun to collaborate with you on the project because I you could see and hear how deep your passion is for it and like and you know, I'm 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 in the process of of getting my producing certificate at UCLA extension and like uh, like the the spirit of making is so powerful and it's like I want to help my friends do things and if I've got and if I can save you time money and effort let's do it and because this thing is about what we can accomplish together and being able to to help you do that and i remember seeing the first cut and you were like you know and it is it's this collaborative thing of like ah he used uh he used that read Ah, i thought he was gonna go with the read where it was like in a world but the but the read and we talked about this like the read that you chose was more was more subdued and it let the action and the energy of the story come forward more so than than you know a big Don LaFontaine impression. <laughs> yeah. Well, your all of your reads were absolutely fantastic, but they do have different vibes. Yeah. And and I went with the more it felt natural but also commanding hmm. because you walked a fantastic line of 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 get your attention in a world type of scenario, but also the line of, Hey, but I'm not being corny. This is genuinely me speaking. Yeah. So now that I have your attention and you trust me, here's why you like this movie. And you walk that fine line so well oh, that you. that was why I chose that take. Awesome. Because it was just the perfect blend. Awesome. Uh, you know, I'm really, uh, it, it's, I'm honored to have been able to collaborate. I'm thrilled that I gave you options and that you found what you needed in that batch and that I didn't feel like, you know, like that that dreaded, hey, uh, so this was fun. Can you, uh, I don't know that you understood the tone. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, and I, of course I would, we'd do it until you got it right, but it was still like, uh, was, I was I was so happy that you got what you needed and stuff. And I was so happy that you did it. It was great. And in fact, fun thing for all the VO people listening is um, I have some awesome surprises that I'll actually tell you right now. I'll reveal it in this. Is one, there's an alternate trailer coming out. <laughs> I I That's also awesome. had my very good friend Jessica Blue yeah do a read of it. Oh, amazing! So we have a female version coming out, and she is just as talented. She's so wonderful. She's you know her. You've worked with her a handful Jessica. of yeah. times. Yeah, she's great. 
And so we have, and she, she has the most wonderful voice. Yeah. If you were to have a female do a sci-fi, like this is a very masculine trailer. Yeah. It's dudes yes, it is. fighting, <laughs> blood, screaming, yelling. Like there's a lot of testosterone. Yes. And she has the perfect voice to bring that trailer to women as well. Oh, Her amazing. voice sounds, it, it, it's almost like it, it has the same vibe as if like the beginning of uh, Dark Crystal or if Sigourney Weaver yeah. voiced it. Like it's a, she's powerful and strong amazing. and, but feminine and it's wonderful. And oh, great, dude. that being said with the two options, there will be as many options as the backers will allow. <laughs> yes. I am releasing a voiceover perk. Oh, wow. So if you buy this perk and support this film, you can record at home the dialogue to the trailer, and I will professionally edit it in and deliver it for you to use for your demo reels. That's amazing. That's an you can amazing put it in perk. Your social media, you can put in your demo reel. I will post it on the alien planet social media. So it's an official trailer and you can say that you did voiceover for my film. Dude, that is so amazing. What a fantastic perk and so generous of your, of your time and support and, and, and helping VO people help, you know, build their reels. And, and like you said early on, like it's about every opportunity to continue to nurture and build that skill and getting to work with a director and have it cut professionally and to have something to be able to show. That's huge, man. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing that with my audience. That's amazing. Absolutely. So anyone listening, like if you, if you are starting, even if you're not starting out, if you just need more stuff yeah. in your reel, I, I know, um, sometimes it's, it's expensive to do, uh, like get, go, go to people to get demos. Yes. People pay to get um, non-airing demos made so you have something to show for to get hired. Absolutely. Um, I guarantee you this perk is going to be cheaper than that. <laughs> uh, and, and it's going to be for something awesome and it's yeah. also going to help to get this movie actually made. Yeah. So, you know, anyone who's listening, if you need that or or are interested, please, please support. I would be honored and and happy to make an, a trailer with your voice in it. Dude, that's amazing. Well, I'm I'm going to put the link in to the uh, to the to the uh, to your fundraising to the campaign in this uh, embedded with this uh, podcast. But but tell me what is how can people find uh, you and find more information and how they can support uh, support the effort to to make Alien Planet. Totally. So if you want to support Alien Planet, which I hope you do, um, <laughs> you know, it, the thing is, is support means so many things. Mm. If you can afford a contribution, that is the greatest thing I could ask for. Even if you can only put $20 in, yeah. it, it genuinely will help. This movie is going to be very expensive um, with all these makeup and prosthetics. So every yeah. dollar counts. And thank you. No matter if you put in one dollar, thank you. Yeah. But if for some reason you cannot afford, because I get it, money is tight, yep. share it. Please, like, if you know someone who's a fan of sci-fi, if you are if you have a friend who you're like, oh, I remember hearing them say that they're like a big fan of Star Trek or, you know, send it to them because they will like this. Yeah. Um, so help any way you can with shares and, and contributions. But if you want to find it, go to Indiegogo. Indiegogo and search Alien Planet. Okay. It's also on all of the social medias. Yes. Alien Planet Film on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Amazing. And every post I post has the link to the campaign. So you will find it if you search it. Um, and that's for the movie. And if you want to follow me in my, my creature career as a performer, I have a lot of awesome things coming up. I've the last... This last month, I had three creature jobs, and I'm doing one. I'm flying to Vegas on Friday for another. Amazing. So if you so guys want to follow all the cool monsters I play, uh, my my Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook is monster underscore maxin. And uh, that will also be in the links. Yep. And if you, if you, for some reason, forget how to spell maxon uh just creatureactor.com it's the simplest thing there's links on my website amazing oh that's so great that's so great 
Dude, I, I mean, I could sit here and talk with you all afternoon, and we would nerd out about Planet of the Apes and we science would. fiction and, and all the amazing things that, uh, <laughs> that, that make life awesome. But I, I can't tell you how proud and lucky I feel to, to call you my friend and my brother and, and all the, you know, just this tremendous amount of, of work that you're putting into bringing something cool to the world to continue to... Uh, inspire the next generation of filmmakers and sci-fi fans as well as to continue to grow your own career it's just it's just fantastic and um dude thank you like the feelings are genuinely mutual like i love you i consider you a brother and there's something about we've talked about this before something about where we came from we came from the same upbringings yeah and i get you yeah. I know who you are, Kip. I see you into your soul. I see you. I get it. I see your wounds. I see your healed strengths. Yes. And I fucking love it. Yeah, like thanks, you, so. you are amazing and you're talented and all the same things you just said to me. Like it's an honor to know you because you have so much awesome stuff behind you and ahead of you. And I'm glad I got to jump in to watch from here on out. Amen. I feel the same way, brother. That was so great. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love you. Much love. And uh, and uh, I encourage my audience to, to follow Alan uh, at monster underscore Maxon and, and other places as well. Please support uh, Alien Planet in any way you can. Share it. Check out the trailer. Uh, compete. Get your voice heard. Uh, participate. And, uh, and, and keep making amazing things uh, because I believe that's what we're called to do. Uh, yes. is to create. It's awesome. <laughs> All right, brother. I will let you go. Uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, thank you for joining, listening. Uh, joining, yes, listening. Thank everybody. Listen, listener, and uh, have a great one. We'll talk to you soon. Peace. Bye, everyone. This has been All Over VoiceOver with Kiff VH. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please go to iTunes and give us a positive rating. It truly helps. Follow me on Twitter at Kiff VH or on Instagram at Kiff VH or on Vero at Kiff VH. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you soon. Claim victory and depart the field. Werewolf? Yeah.